Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. New details on Quebec's controversial face covering law. I feel like someone's gonna come rip my niqab off. The federal government announces a windfall and parents of young children will benefit. Another close call in California. Canada 781 go around. Canada 781 go around. Why that flight didn't respond. And a glimpse into the final weeks of one woman's life through moments of grief, love, and even laughter. It's so beautiful. <laughs> In an attempt to calm the backlash, today the Quebec government described how it will enforce its new law that forces people to show their faces when giving or receiving public services. It's a law that's seen by many as discriminatory against Muslim women. Some specific examples we got today at the doctor's office, you do have to show your face when checking in with ID, but you don't while sitting in the waiting room. At the library, you don't have to show your face to look at books, but you do when talking to staff. And in school, you do have to show your face when sitting in the classroom, not just for exams. Alison Northcott tells us more. For the past week, Fatima Ahmad has avoided taking the bus since Quebec passed what it calls a religious neutrality bill. Right now I'm heading to my university. She's been getting a ride to school with her dad instead. Even if public workers are not enforcing it, I feel like the citizens are taking uh, actions on their own hands and I feel like someone's going to come rip my niqab off or they're just, I don't know what's going to happen, like I, I fear for my life. The new law aims to address a decade-long debate in Quebec around secularism but has prompted protests and criticism from some who say it unfairly targets Muslim women and it's raised a lot of questions and confusion about how it will be applied and enforced. Today, Quebec's justice minister tried to clarify the rules. Honestly, um, I'm just sorry that it wasn't as clear. And maybe what I'm doing today, I should have done the day after we adopted the bill. She says no one will be thrown off a bus, refused emergency health care or chased out of a library, but says people will have to show their faces when photo ID is required and in interactions with public servants. The minister says the law will be applied with common sense for identification, communication and security purposes. On transit, it means a bus driver can ask a woman to remove her niqab to verify the photo on a discounted transit pass. If she complies, she can ride public transit where her veil. Montreal Mayor Denis Coderre says the law still puts undue pressure on city employees and won't survive a court challenge. I'm consistent. I'm totally against it. The law also applies in classes at schools and universities where some professors say they won't enforce it. I will not enforce the standard that says everyone must have their face uncovered in order to receive instruction. Okay, take care. Ahmad says she doesn't mind showing her face when she needs to be identified. In fact, she says she already does that for her passport and university exams. But she says the law and the confusion around it have made her life harder. And I use public services all the time. I go, I go to university, I use the public transports, I go to the bank, I go everywhere. So this has limited my access to almost almost everything. While there are no penalties for non-compliance, the government says it could seek a court injunction against those who don't enforce the law. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. A little later, we'll have more on the new rules and how Quebec's past plays a part. That past includes a crucifix in the Quebec National Assembly that still hangs today. And amidst the calls for religious neutrality, a Quebec Solidaire MA presented a motion today calling for a debate on whether the Christian symbol should be removed. The caucus uh, decided that we will not consent to the motion that was deposited by Quebec Solidaire. So there will be no debate. The Liberal caucus chair says her party is open and inclusive, but that it doesn't believe in erasing Quebec's heritage. Bill Morneau unveiled the federal government's economic update today, and to some, it's a crowd pleaser. As we first reported last night, the finance minister announced a boost to the Canada Child Benefit, as well as help for the working poor and shrinking federal deficits, all thanks to a windfall from unexpected economic growth. David Cochran has the details from Ottawa. The finance minister hasn't had a day like this in a while. 
a chance to talk about the country's finances instead of his own. We came to office knowing that growing the middle class is how we grow the economy. Today, we're doubling down on that strategy because it's a strategy that's working. Morneau announced billions of new spending to enrich old programs, pumping up the Canada child benefit checks that parents get every month by indexing them to the cost of living. He also boosted a tax benefit to help low-income workers. When Canadians succeed, they grow our economy, they create jobs, and together, we build a better future. Morneau argues programs like the Child Benefit are driving economic growth by putting money into the hands of people who need it and will spend it. As proof, he says growth, revenues and jobs are up while the deficit is down by more than $8 billion. Ever. But it's not gone. There is literally not a single year into the distant future when this government projects ever eliminating the deficit. Morneau is projecting that the federal deficit will shrink, but it never gets to zero. Instead, he is choosing to borrow money to pay for the new spending. Where is the risk? I think, yeah, I think the risk that inflation will be higher, um, the risk that interest rates will be higher, um, you know, and the risk that the government is going to struggle to control program spending growth. So it's obviously uh, a way for the Liberal government to try to deflect attention from the problems that, that the minister is actually experiencing right now. Today may not deflect from the problems Morneau has had over how he's handled his personal fortune, but tomorrow he is set to meet with the Ethics Commissioner and to seek her advice on how to sell his assets, set up his blind trust, and try to put all of this behind him. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The update also included the price tags for certain projects, some of which are already on the go. More than $500 million have been earmarked for Health Canada, the RCMP and other agencies to handle the legalization of marijuana. Global Affairs will have more money for security at embassies and consulates. And the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Coast Guard will get more than a billion dollars to maintain their fleets. Today's economic update was a chance for Bill Morneau to change the channel. The finance minister has been at the centre of a conflict of interest controversy. Chris Hall joins me now. So Chris, these updates, they're always political, but this one in particular, tell us about that. Well, that's right. The Liberals have been really off message, Wendy, in recent weeks, whether it was Bill Morneau's continued ownership of millions of dollars of shares in his family company or a plan to tax employee discounts. They were looking anything but like a party of the middle class. And that was the political imperative today, to remind middle class voters that the Liberals are still on their side, to credit some of the measures like the Canada Child Benefit and the Working Income Tax Benefit for the great growth in the economy over the past two years. And that was the entire purpose here, was to try to remind those middle class voters that they will be better off, that they can look into their pockets and see more money, and they're betting they're more concerned about that than they are about the size, for example, of the deficit. So will the tactic work? Well, it's an interesting question. It didn't work in question period. Uh, the opposition was still asking Bill Morneau about his perceived conflict of interest. And there are a lot of risks here with, uh, with this political reward that they're trying to get. The first is that the NAFTA talks are not going well, so economic growth is not guaranteed uh, in the future. And there's also the concern with the consumer debt now at almost historic highs that there's not a lot of wiggle room for Bill Morneau to have here if the plan doesn't go uh, as he plans. Again, the betting, though, politically, is that out there in the real world that Canadians are far more concerned about their economic well-being and far less concerned about any appearance of conflict of interest here in Ottawa. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Wendy. Chris Hall in Ottawa tonight. Coming up, another close call at San Francisco's airport involving an Air Canada plane. And your mom will not die short of breath. She will die because she will forget to breathe. An emotional journey through the final weeks of a woman's life. We follow one family as they say a painful goodbye. A bribery trial involving a provincial by-election and two Ontario Liberals came to an abrupt end today. A Sudbury judge dismissed the charges for lack of evidence. The acquittal clears two top Liberals, but it's also a huge relief for Premier Kathleen Wynne. The CBC's Mike Crawley explains. This trial could have become a political disaster for Kathleen Wynne. The allegations were that one of Wynne's closest advisors, Pat Cerbera, bribed a would-be candidate not to run in a by-election, and that she offered another bribe to the man the Ontario Liberals actually wanted to run. 
This had been the biggest scandal directly touching Wynne since she became Premier in 2013. She was even called as a witness to testify in the trial. The controversy helped drag down her approval ratings to rock bottom levels. She's the least popular Premier in Canada, with the next Ontario election just over seven months away. But now the charges are tossed out for lack of evidence. So this is a huge weight lifted off Wynne's shoulders. It weakens one of the main lines of attack that the opposition parties want to use against her, which is trying to persuade voters that the Ontario Liberals are corrupt. No matter what the judge ruled today, the Ontario Liberals face a tough campaign. That's why Wynne's government is rolling out a bunch of new initiatives, such as free prescription drugs for children and young adults, and a big increase to the minimum wage. Now these acquittals could provide another boost to Wynne's efforts to get re-elected next June. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. A huge blackout across Montreal had over a quarter of a million customers in the dark this morning. It started around 9 a.m. and took one of Montreal's metro lines down for about an hour. Hydro-Quebec says the outage was caused by a worker who accidentally cut a single power line. It took about three hours to restore power to most customers. A spark of light seen in the sky over St. John's last night has been identified as a meteor. Security video shows the moment the flaming ball streaked across the sky. An astronomer believes it was part of the Orionid meters, meteors that usually peak in mid-autumn. For the second time in three months, an Air Canada flight faced a close call on landing at San Francisco International Airport. U.S. aviation officials are now investigating an incident from the weekend when air traffic controllers' repeated messages went unanswered by the Air Canada crew. Aaron Collins reports. Air Canada 781, go around. The trouble started Sunday night when Air Canada Flight 781 made its final approach into San Francisco. Initially given permission to land, the control tower tried to contact the plane, worried their runway may still be occupied. Canada 781, go around. Over and over, the tower tried to contact the inbound flight, even flashing a red stoplight at the plane. No response until the Airbus A320 was safely on the ground, complaining of a faulty radio. Uh, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration is looking into the Air Canada pilot's lack of response and his concerns about his radio. Canadian officials are looking into it too. We have uh, uh, appointed somebody to, to be there uh, to follow that. The uh, Transportation Safety Board has done the same thing. And now uh, it's the job that has to be done every time uh, something like this happens of investigating to see exactly what caused this situation to occur. It isn't the first time an Air Canada landing has been investigated by the FAA recently. Just three months ago, another Air Canada flight nearly landed on a taxiway at the same airport, coming dangerously close to crashing into four planes. Uh, United One, Air Canada flew directly over us. Block, uh, 59 One, Air Canada flew directly over us. Yeah, I saw that, guys. That led to changes in how nighttime landings are conducted at the San Francisco airport. Some airline insiders say a second incident on that same runway could mean there are more problems at the facility, but adds there's no excuse for ignoring the control tower. When you don't hear a communication from air traffic control for 30 to 45 seconds when you're on final approach, you better be contacting them to find out what the hell is going on. Experts say news of another close call won't likely scare off Air Canada's customers, but they add that that's exactly what the airline should be worried about. Oh, I think that the third time would be, would really would be uh, very negative for Air Canada uh, because it would suggest there's a clear pattern at that point. For its part, Air Canada says its own internal investigation into Sunday's incident is already underway. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. The Hudson's Bay Company is selling a prime New York property for $1 billion. The building is currently home to Lord & Taylor's flagship store. The retail giant has been under pressure to sell its real estate to pay off debts. It's also facing calls to give up another property, Saks Fifth Avenue's flagship store, valued at more than $4.5 billion. Quebec's controversial face covering law has been called intolerant, even racist. Straight ahead, we'll look at the wider context.
next four years are going to be difficult and challenging years for us all. Every degree of mind and spirit that I possess will be devoted to the long-range interests of the United States. It is a mandate for unity, for a government that serves no special interest. This will be an open administration, open to new ideas, open to men and women of both parties, open to the critics as well as those who support us. After almost two years of campaigning, Jimmy Carter was back home and had kept his word. I told you I didn't intend to lose. I consider the trust that you have placed in me sacred, and I give you my sacred oath that I will do my utmost to justify your faith. We can now speak the most majestic words a democracy has to offer. The people have spoken. On this day, with high hopes and brave hearts, in massive numbers, the American people have voted to make a new beginning. In just a few moments, history will unfold again when George W. Bush delivers his much-delayed victory speech. We agreed to do our best to heal our country after this hard-fought contest. Out of many, we are one. That while we breathe, we hope. And where we are met with cynicism and doubt, and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. It's not about what someone can wear or not wear. That's something that's important to say, but, but it's important. It's about uh, having public service rendered with the face uncovered. Back to our top story, Quebec's attempt to clarify its position on a controversial new law. It forces people to show their face when they give or receive public services, including riding the bus, sitting in a classroom. Critics say it discriminates against Muslim women who wear the niqab. And it's not the first time religion and politics have clashed in Quebec. For decades in Quebec, the Catholic Church was all-powerful. But in the 1960s, the Quiet Revolution took hold. The values that has replaced the Christian values have been the uh, value of change. The role of big religion took a backseat to big government. It's time for the change. Women, who'd been told to stay home and have kids, took up feminism. Later, with immigration and changing demographics, came a different kind of challenge and debates over how to accommodate other cultures and religions. Je suis un raciste. The last three premiers of Quebec have all introduced some sort of religious neutrality law. Pauline Marois' Charter of Values got the most attention, igniting controversy across the country. Philippe Cuillard's Bill 62 is now law, prompting accusations of racism from outside Quebec. Joining me now from Montreal, the Globe and Mail's Quebec Bureau Chief, Les Perrault. So, Les, you've had the job for the last few years of trying to explain to a, an English-speaking audience uh, Quebec politics. How do you explain the popularity of this law, of Law 62? Well, Wendy, it goes back to the aftermath of 9-11 uh, when uh, Muslims around the world, really, were under a huge amount of scrutiny. Uh, and in Quebec, that scrutiny also turned to whether Muslims were integrating easily into Quebec society. And so for a while in the mid-2000s there, in the 2005-2006 uh, sort of range, there was a story every week about how people from religious minorities uh, were supposedly not integrating uh, into Quebec society. Uh, sometimes it was things as silly as, uh, you know, a shop owner, a restaurant owner who was taken to task for taking pork out of his pea soup to accommodate Muslims. But there were other more serious questions about, you know, does a devoutly religious man uh, have the right to 
insist on speaking to a male police officer. So at, with story after story like this in the, in around 2005, uh, it became to be known as a accommodation crisis in Quebec. And uh, to be honest, we've been dealing with it uh, ever since. It's, and yet it's, it's presented now as either a feminist argument or about religious neutrality, not about issues of... Of, of, of Muslims moving in and, and, and terrorizing people. I mean, and so a lot of progressive, a lot of feminist Quebecers are saying this, this, is, this is the morally right thing to do. And yet people in the rest of the country, some of them, many of them are saying it's racist. Is, is it racist? Well, I can't really, uh, I'm not going to really get into whether or not it's racist, but what I can tell you is there's a wide range of opinions among the people who support it. And as you, as you point out, uh, there is a high level of support for doing something about religious accommodation. Bill 62 does have, did have a fairly wide uh, range of support, uh, up into the high 80%, I believe, uh, when it was uh, polled a couple months ago. But that was before that people started to realize it would mean things like women being banned from buses or, or from public libraries. Now, the, the government has clarified that since. But quite often what we've seen is a pattern where people believe in principle that Quebec should be a neutral state. They believe in principle that people should interact face-to-face uh, -face when they're obtaining government services. And then when you, the rubber meets the road and, and people start being denied services, it actually causes quite a surprise among people because the difference between principle and how it's applied uh, is fairly vast. So they like religious neutrality in theory only? Well, that's what it looks like so far, because so far three governments have tried and failed to find a sort of legislative uh, compromise that would satisfy everyone. and. Uh, and they have, haven't been able to find it. Now, the question of racism is interesting because Quebec, like every part of North America and the world, has its racists too. And certainly those people uh, are, uh, are happy to see Muslims put in their place. But there, there's also, as you say, there's, there's feminists that are, are backing this. There's conservatives who back it. There's nationalists who back it who aren't necessarily uh, white supremacists. But there is also white supremacists who back it. Uh, you know, we've had an upswing in extreme right-wing activity in Quebec. Those people want to see Muslims put in their place. Now, they're not the philosophical underpinnings of all this. They're not the ones driving it, but these people, uh, they're, they're among the people that are sort of on the on, uh, part of the movement, I guess. The other question that's been raised is one of, isn't the, I guess, the, the accusations of hypocrisy about the crucifix in the National Assembly, in the legislature, like that's not exactly religiously neutral. <laughs> well, there, there again, right, there's a wide variety of views. There are people in Quebec, and uh, some of them are people I know, who want to see religion expunged in all its forms from, uh, from sort of public, uh, public uh, government sort of sphere. Uh, there are people who, frankly, think this whole thing is a bad idea and wish it would all just be left alone, including leaving the crucifix uh, hanging on the, on, the, on the wall in the National Assembly. And... When you sort of add it all up, uh, there, the, then there's everyone in between, of course, too, who, who have elements of hypocrisy in their views and they're, they're conflicted. There's the excuse that uh, the crucifix is part of our heritage. Well, sure it is, but it's part of our religious heritage is what it is. Well, today there seemed to be a bit of a backtrack uh, and there's, uh, from the government. There's questions as to how it can even be imposed and, and questions of whether it's even constitutional. There's so much to think about, but thank you for laying out where this came from. Les, it was, uh, it was great to talk to you. My pleasure, Wendy. Thank you. Coming up next on The National. Morologist came in and he basically explained that uh, she had ALS. So it was just a, a bomb went off in the room and everybody was just silent for a while. That was the beginning of the journey. We'll show you the end an intimate look at the final days of one woman's life in hospice care. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 49 points. The dollar fell more than a tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow added 167 points to close at a new high. The price of oil was up 57 cents a barrel. For every performer you see on the screen, there are literally hundreds of people just outside the range of the cameras, each with a vital role to play. From the master craftsman in negative film cutting, 
to the technicians who duplicate our scripts, from the artists who design our sets, to the delightfully eccentric genius who must edit this film you're watching. I don't think this will cut. Because CBC Toronto's job is serving the public, it must keep pace with community development, to go where the action is, to cover and report on a wide range of outside events, whether it be a royal visit, a football game, or a civic election. The Toronto operation has a wide scope. It allows the imagination to stretch farther than a camera cable. Over the years, the gleaming double blue of the huge three-camera color mobile units have become as much a part of the fabric of this growing city as her dazzling city hall complex. Now it's okay. Look, you stay. I'm all wound up. I gotta get away. No, this place is beginning to bug me. I'll go. No, no, if you stay, I'll go. I'll go. I ain't shit. Why don't both of us? The great bulk of present day programming is packaged and edited electronically under the nimble fingers of the videotape editor and under the eye of the program producer and script assistant. So that's the one that's about the third number on after the last one we saw. And we'll leave your levels up for a moment. Master Control. And as the name implies, these men and machines are the masters of CBC Toronto the flagship station of the English network. And it is through this sophisticated gear that every film, tape, or live program From is funneled. The nerve center of CBC broadcasting in Toronto isn't hard to find. Just peek under the tower. There you'll see the Jarvis Street complex, the TV building flanked by the huge Studio 7 on Mutual Street, and the annex on the right housing the CBC executive offices. And over on the left, the one-time girls' school turned radio building. You won't hear much in the way of school cheers coming from the radio building these days, but you hear just about everything else. sound effects department, kicking up a storm. We hope to get this from Washington, a three billion dollar... Uh... CBC Radio News, one of the most versatile and far-flung news agencies in the world, with tape news reports and live feeds from the four corners of the globe. Fine, thank you, Norm. Levels, please, uh, Jim first. British MP Bernadette Devlin flew from Shannon to New York today on a fundraising visit. The world at eight. Good morning from CBC News, etc. That's fine. Thanks very much. Hi, everything okay? Yeah. See, you made it on time for once. Okay. The world at eight. Good morning from CBC News. This is Jim Chorley with Rex Loring. Here are the headlines. <laughs> She is my the only one daughter. She is the most important and more important than my life. Sometimes at the end of a person's life, what really matters comes into sharp focus. Diana Fitzharris had just days to live when that was recorded. She was dying of ALS with her husband and 14-year-old daughter by her side. CBC producer Diane Grant brings us this candid glimpse into her final few weeks, a project that was inspired by Diane's own experience. Petra Jordan, August 2014. This was my husband's first camel ride. One of Gary's favorite pastimes was being a goof and making me laugh. We didn't know it then but the countdown had begun. He was dying of cancer. This is what he looked like three years later. 
It's the only home video I ever took. It pains me to look at it now. He had undergone a major operation to remove his esophagus, radiation and chemotherapy treatments. Nothing had worked. Days after that video, he became delirious, and I took him to the May Court Hospice in Ottawa. When Gary arrived, I remember you telling me that you wanted him to be lucid so you could have some moments with him. And uh, I thought to myself at the time, oh, that's a long shot. I really did. I did not think it was possible, given his illness. Gary and I spent three weeks at the May Court, and slowly he became aware of me again. I was thrilled to see that he became lucid with um, you know, minimal intervention on my part. And uh, that was a real, like I said, that's, it was a surprise to me that he became lucid. Uh, I think maybe you willed it. <laughs> <laughs> and that he responded. When his breathing changed and death was imminent, the nurse left us alone. He died to the sound of my voice, telling him that I would love him forever. It's not like I can tell a person this is what hospice care is like, but they won't really get it, the depth of it, until they actually experience it. I knew that I had to return to this place and walk with another family and through them show the gift that I was given when I brought my dying, broken husband here to live fully right up to the end. This, I turn right. No, it's just like, how are you supposed to push someone up like this? <laughs> One, two, three. Either I'm just like very weak. Okay, go. Five I months after it. my I husband's it. death, I, got it. I met I got Diana it. Fitzharris. Got it. Oh, oh, okay, pull it. Oh, pull it. Yeah. Pull here. Yeah. Your mom will not die short of breath. She will die because she will forget to breathe. That's how it's going to happen. Diana invited me to record the last days of her life. My name is Mark Fitzharris, and I'm Diana Fitzharris' husband. That's what I call the backseat driver. It just didn't seem like something that would happen to Diana. She was just too strong, too independent. She's like, this is a joke. This is a bad joke. You can just take the seat out when she gets up. Huh? Neurologist came in and he basically explained that uh, she had ALS. So was just a, a bomb went off in the room and everybody was just silent for a while, processing what that meant. Something that kills your nerves and your muscles eventually will die off. I'm just going, oh my God, <laughs> you can't get much worse than that. And uh, I'm looking at her and she's kind of like, like I can tell in her look in her face, she's kind of like, I don't know what this means, Mark, but is it bad or good? I, I got the look in my face like, we're gonna talk later. We're gonna talk later because I, I, I know what it is. Oh my gosh, I'm shocked. Huge shock, I think. That's impossible. That's not me. That's not me. I won't be so bad luck. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, two and a half year now. Yes, I'm bad luck. I have to admit, I'm bad luck. So I got AOS.
We have a daughter, Gwendolyn, who's 14 right now. You didn't take a shower. And I didn't take a shower in eight days. You have it? Gwendolyn is very um, okay, I'll get uh, important okay. to, yeah. to keeping this situation also very good for Diana. She needs Gwendolyn around her. A few days. I didn't really cope very well yeah, in the beginning. Um, I think I've gotten a lot better. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. She is my the only one daughter. She is the most important and more important than my life. Hey, do you remember when you are little, you always cry, cannot I, sleep? Uh -huh. Then you know what I do? Put your hand on my face? Yeah. I want to try, but I cannot. Okay. Put in my hand. Just like that. Yeah. yeah. And then you stop coming. Yeah. And you become sleep like that. Anything sore? Yeah. What? Six months ago, approximately, she started needing help. Like, I started needing help in the house with her. Your ribs are sore? Yeah, yeah. Diana is really uh, acute to what's going on around her, and she's like a. Her brain is like normal. So, there is a bed available for tomorrow. Oh, for tomorrow? Yeah, when we first met Dr. Coulomb, she um, came, and I guess you know, people talk about her like she's one of the greatest. She's a great doctor to have in going through this. So when I met her and I had already known that and then it wasn't two minutes of talking to her and I was just like, oh yes, this woman speaking makes me feel good. <laughs> I have my card, which every patient gets. So they know how to contact me by my cell phone. They have my email address and... My day in the life is trying to find and put order in chaos. It's basically what it is. I'm asked two questions. How long and what's it going to be like? When I went to Mark's and Diana's house, the first thing I noticed and it's the first thing I know is going to anybody's home is are we on one level or two levels? And we were on two levels and it was essential for her to go from one level to the next. And I knew with respiratory problems that would not be possible until her death. So I'm here with Diana Fitzharris and yes, she is going to the hospital, there's a bed t tomorrow. So we need, we're going to do it by private ambulance. So we need the phone numbers or can you do that? Or do they, does Mark need to do that? Yes, it would be tomorrow's somewhere, right, either 12 to 1, something like that. Okay. There's going to be no room when we pull it up in the truck. Okay. Once we get in the truck, you can take it off and... Because you're going to be right beside her. There's going to be no room when we fold it up in the truck. Okay. Once we get in the truck, you can take it off and slow it back up a bit. And let's not forget her glasses. Yes, see yes, where she's glasses. going. Come here. Just a minute. Yeah, today um, Diane is going to the hospice. Yep. This morning I woke up a very, very, um, upset, like very sad, because the realization of this is the last day my wife is going to be in our house with me.
Oh, yeah? I guess I should go say hi to him. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, are you okay? Yeah. First time. Last time. Yeah. And you're okay? You've been here before or not? What are you doing? No. You guys, okay. Remember, she's going to have a really good time out there in the garden. Okay. Okay. I feel I'm like a queen. Yeah. They do everything for me. So comfortable. <laughs> You go picnic outside. Can you picnic outside? Diana? Yes! I can uh, I can have the, put the water, the jar, coffee, mm -hmm. food, cookies, cookies, cookies. tidbits. Yeah. Some ice table here. <laughs> now, I didn't ask you about something to drink. Would you like something to drink with this? Okay, what you've what your friend ordered for you was beef stew and vegetable fried rice. That's and good. some grapes. So do I. And I talked to her this morning. We made a deal with she's she gonna come back home. She, she told me. You know your mother, she's crazy. She could probably do it. Right? Pictures of you and me and me and you and dad. Oh, you and me and the me and the me. <laughs> and dad and you. Uh, yeah. They asked me how old is your daughter. I said my daughter over there. Yeah, that's right. So the rest of the day you can spend your time in this garden. Beautiful. It is. Wait a moment. It's so beautiful. <laughs> there you go. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna leave you alone. Enjoy your friends and family. Okay. Okay. I'll be back tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I don't want to cry, <laughs> and I do end up crying, but not in front of my mom. Um, and I feel like if I cry, it'll make her feel bad. So you're probably a little bit dehydrated. I don't know. Every day the same way I just get up. Mm. I just cannot. Mm. And slowly, 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 and then I get normal. Mm. Mm. wonderful place and it's getting me rest it's getting Diana maybe a little extra pampering that she deserves I know you said that you didn't want me to be there when you're passing away because you you were thinking about my feelings but I want you to be thinking about your feelings because in this like situation it's okay to be like selfish and like but I just like want to know what you want because mm -hmm. like I don't know what I want I cannot answer you this question why I cannot answer you I just cannot but honestly I really in my mind, in my heart, I feel, oh, I'm not there. I cannot see that. Okay, Mark, what do you think? If I pass away, you want to be with me here, watch, oh, you don't. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be here. You? Yeah, that's, 
I made that known from the beginning. Okay. Even though people are dying, it, uh, you see uh, people transcending suffering and coming to terms with their lives and discussions about faith and love and community and um, all the important things about life just kind of bubble to the surface. Before we come to this point, we did have meetings about doctor-assisted suicide, and we looked at that option. She chose an option that she liked, that she felt comfortable with, and I'm so glad she did. We have a very uh, spirited edition of Take 30 today. It was awfully nice of you to come today, Paul. I'm so glad you took the time out. On a stormy winter night, I went out walking, and I walked into a cemetery. I'm frightened already. Continue. I looked down, and there it was. Oh! You're kidding me! I need a sucker! Shelling out for suckers may be a long way from catching souls for the devil. But which one of these, for all their innocence, doesn't wonder for at least one nervous moment about that special thrill in the air tonight? Ooh. What is it? <laughs> oh, it's a hand! These scenes were repeated across the country tonight. Kids having a good time. Nothing more, certainly nothing less. Halloween is plain fun. But you can get hungry having fun. Melissa and Jamie didn't wait to get home to test the treats. Look what I just got. What is it? Sandy, this yum. I love it. Ah, I love it, Halloween. And then I felt something under my feet that was soft and squishy, and I didn't know whose it was. <gasps> it's a brain. It's a, a brain. <laughs> Charles Chaplin, how could you dream of abolishing Halloween? You're talking about my favorite night of the year. <laughs> Barbara, I'm a spoil sport, and I've come increasingly to feel that Halloween is a conspiracy put on by the candy makers and the dentists and the costume makers. And I think it's time that we took a stand. And the next thing I knew, something was hanging in the air, and I, I felt it, and I wasn't quite sure. <gasps> what was that? Hair. <laughs> Everybody gets a real charge of a scaring people. I mean, it's a known mm -hmm. fact, regardless who you are. You say no, but you do. <laughs> this is the CBC Television Network. As his guests arrived early in the morning, Jeff Pelche was already in his North Vancouver garden. He was shining up his pumpkin like it was his first car. This, after all, is one of his greatest achievements. This is my Atlantic giant pumpkin, and he's affectionately called Grout after the giant in Harry Potter. Look at the abs on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's a beauty. Grop is well over a thousand pounds, raised on good soil and good music. He loves Shostakovich, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> For a hundred days, the neighbors have watched the gourd grow, cheering him on every step of the way. Except when the manure was, was brought in. But today they celebrate. Grop is about to be snipped. Here we go. Jeff, don't cry. Oh. He's headed to BC's giant pumpkin competition. When you come up off the ground, just stay about two inches so I can check everything. Jeff does not let go. This part's always very, very nerve-wracking. After all, no one wants to see Grop go splat at this point. The operation from garden to crane to truck is a success. The lovely abs are not bruised. Let her down. Sweet. Perfect. Perfect. Oh! Trapped 
who will likely die when we attempt to move him. Racing to save a life. Searching for answers. This was no accident. And all new Murdoch Mysteries, Monday, November 6th on CBC. A war of words between the U.S. president and a Republican senator got uglier today. Donald Trump has been taking aim at Bob Corker with insults and name-calling. Corker, in turn, has gone just short of calling the president a liar. Paul Hunter tells us Corker's not the only Republican hitting back at Trump. For those who've wondered when might Republicans turn on Donald Trump, today you know, enter U.S. Senator dollars. Jeff Flake. And there are times when we must risk our careers in favor of our principles. Now is such a time. What followed was a stunning rebuke of the U.S. president. Calling fake things true and true things fake. Flake spoke of discord and dysfunction, of reckless, outrageous, and undignified behavior emanating from the top. The personal attacks, the threats against principles, freedoms and institution, the flagrant disregard for truth and decency. The speech ran a remarkable 17 minutes, and that's not the half of it. As if to underline it this morning, another Republican senator, Bob Corker, like Flake, a Trump critic, found himself in an epic insult battle with the U.S. president. I don't know why he lowers himself uh, to such a low, low standard and debases our country in the way that he does. Earlier on Twitter, Trump had called Corker an incompetent lightweight who couldn't get elected dog catcher. Replied Corker, Trump is an utterly untruthful, bullying president in a White House that needs adult supervision. Is the president of the United States a liar? The president uh, has great difficulty with the truth on many issues. The twin assaults on Trump came as Trump himself sought Senate support for his plan to reform the U.S. tax code. It would be Trump's first major legislation, but it's a plan critics say would benefit mostly the wealthy. Did you see the Senator Corker as the president? Trump took no questions after a lunchtime meeting on that with senators, and it was just after that lunch that Flake stood up in the Senate chamber. We must stop pretending that the de de degradation of our politics and the conduct of some in our executive branch are normal. They are not normal. Flake called speaking out a matter of duty and conscience, adding that to stay silent at this time is profoundly misguided. The question tonight, how many more of Trump's fellow Republicans are now set to speak out as well? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The White House has lifted the complete ban on refugees entering the United States, but the resumption of the refugee program comes with some restrictions. A new executive order issued today adds what officials call enhanced screening for applicants and people coming from 11 unnamed countries considered high risk by the United States. Those will be subject to a 90-day review period. The countdown to next year's Winter Games in Pyeongchang has started with a lighting today of the Olympic torch. The fire is traditionally lit using sunlight on the site of the ancient Greek stadium. But clouds meant the high priestess, played by an actor, had to rely on a backup flame. It was then relayed to the first torchbearer waiting outside. The flame is expected to reach South Korea in a week. We'll have a recap of the day's top stories after the break. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, from three-headed mice to shoes made of deer hooves, the new generation of mostly female taxidermists is finding new expression in an old art form. Rogue Taxidermy, on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. And 1961 was the year that Toronto was invaded from the West. The big Grey Cup parade through the downtown streets was one of the best ever staged in the East. Westerners with 10-gallon hats and half-court flasks arrived by train, plane and car. And parties blossomed in just about every hotel in the city. This is the 30th Grey Cup Festival with events planned right up until game time on Sunday afternoon. And the big event tonight was the selection of Miss Grey Cup 1978. The 
via rail panorama was heading for Edmonton. It was fully loaded. In 18 hours, they had managed to drink the bar car dry of beer. 600 bottles, all gone. Some stopped drinking long enough to find their way back to their seats, and they drank some more. Others found comfort on luggage racks or high up on out-of-the-way perches. Winnipeg football pride was everywhere. Via ticket agents tell us that there are 20 Hamilton Tiger Cat fans on board this train, but no one's been able to find them. Where? Where, Where are, are they? Are they? Are they? Are they? Yeah, we ate them for breakfast. <laughs> this town has gone Grey Cup crazy, from Western breakfasts to this Western visitor in a hotel lobby. Americans, like this reporter for Sports Illustrated, can't believe it. I've been to eight Super Bowls in the U.S., and there's no, there's nothing like the spontaneity that I see here. And it spilled onto the streets today. Fans line the sidewalks ten deep. I'm pulling for our Stampeders, but my heart is still with the Bombers. <laughs> The overnight train into Edmonton this morning, filled with determined football fans. Uh, we left at 6 o'clock last night. Just since Melville, Saskatchewan. Oh, just oh, uh, 14 about, hours. Uh, 14 beers. <laughs> we come to Grey Cup every year. It's a super party. Go Riders, go! Onward Riders, onward Riders. Hey, we're here! I'm here with Sandy right now, who is also known as the Flame. Maybe I shouldn't be so close. Are you loaded? We're loaded, ready to go. You do. It was Grey Cup time, and a good time it was, with floats and bands and pretty girls. I was the wrestling champion of the world. And he's the best in the world at what he does. Until I lost it all. You got fired from wrestling, right? Now I'm starting over and I'm free at last! And I'm gonna be the greatest actor of all time. I wanna study the craft of acting. If I can get you waiting tables, you'll really be an actor. Agent is a jackass. Let's see what you got. Prepare for glory! Told you he has brain damage. No, I don't have brain damage. But I'm Chris Jericho. working with is not the original. This one is a clone. I think he just needs to be treated like any other horse. Cloning? How long has she been doing this? Do you realize that if it gets out, it can jeopardize my business dealings? Heartland, Sunday at 7 on CBC. Before we go, a quick recap of some of our top stories. There's been such backlash over a controversial law banning face coverings when giving or receiving public services in Quebec, the province responded today by softening the details of how it will be enforced. It says the law will focus on identification, communication, and security. Finance Minister has unveiled the state of the government's coffers. Bill Morneau says the economy is doing so well is a windfall. So. The Liberals are spending more to increase benefits. The deficit projections have also been cut to about $20 billion for next year. U.S. aviation officials are investigating an Air Canada flight to San Francisco Sunday night. First cleared for landing, pilots were then told repeatedly not to land. But they didn't respond and later said their radio wasn't working. The plane landed safely. That's the national for this Tuesday night, but I've got a little bit of personal news. I'm going to disappear for a bit, going to develop a new show, which starts in January on Sunday morning, so I hope you'll watch that. Um, some of my interviews will show up here on the national, so I'll be seeing you here too. Thanks for watching.